What I'd like to do now is I'm going to introduce Hillary Mason. So let me give you a quick rundown. So Hillary is the um, chief scientist at Bitly. She's been there about three and a half years. But in addition to that, she's actually uh, comes to us from New York City. So she flew across the country to do this, which we're, we're uh, very, very happy for her uh, to participate here. But she's very vested in the New York City technical community. She co-founded Hack NY about four years ago, which helps get young engineers into startup companies. Uh, she's a member of the NYC Resistor Group, uh, which, and I'm gonna let her describe this, but it just shows that she likes to build absurd technology. Did I get that right? Okay. And then I think most significantly, she's actually on the Mayor Bloomberg uh, Technical Advisory Council that helps really drive technology and innovation and uh, expanding the technology community inside of New York City. So. Uh, for all those reasons and many more, which you'll start to, you'll hear about here shortly, please help me welcome Hillary to the stage. Thank you. Great. Good morning. I'm Hillary. I am one of the others in that pie chart in terms of what I do with my life. Um, I'm an algorithmicist who's found my way into building infrastructure and big data uh, from the theory side. I work at Bitly, where we know more about animated GIFs and Kim Kardashian than uh, you ever wanted to know. And I'm H. Mason on Twitter, so if you have a question, we should have time at the end for questions, but um, if you have one, feel free to tweet it at me. I'll make sure to, to answer it. And H at Bitly if you're too shy to do it in public. So yesterday was the 20th anniversary of the web. 20 years, right? And today, actually, is uh, the 40-hour work week was invented by Ford in 1926, May 1st. It's a good day to start to think back um, to where, where we started and how we got to where we are now. So do you remember search before Google? Looking around the room here, I see some people who definitely remember before the web and some people who definitely were born after it was created. Um, but when you think about it, like it was really weird. Um, the internet when I was growing up looked kind of like this, right? BBSs, you met people, you were geographically constrained by your local phone calls. Um, and then it looked like this. This still works, by the way. Um, and we had these weird structured called web rings. Like people thought we could organize web pages by manually classifying them in massive cylindrical structures where you could go to the next thing in the ring, the previous one, or jump to a random point in the ring, and this was how you were gonna find the things you were most interested in. They still exist, actually. I wanna bring them back. Um, and then we got to this, right? So, uh, so somebody would crawl the content of the web, they'd count up the keywords in it, we'd do a little TFIDF and you'd search. Um, and that worked okay, but there was a lot of spam and, um, and we couldn't find people at all. In fact, the only way to find people at this point in the 90s was to take the white pages, which was a book, and put it on the internet, right? And so Yahoo came along and Yahoo said, okay, you know, we're gonna organize the internet. And they, they did a, a mix of machine and human curated organization. But there were actual people who were employed as Yahoo curators. I knew one of them, I thought it was an awesome job. Um, but something happened, right? And the thing that happened was that people found ways to use machines to construct a much more navigable way to index all of this content. And the people who did that were Google. Um, and so all of a sudden they had some insight about the innate structure of the web that allowed us to build machines to let people navigate through it much more effectively. And this is Google in the year 2000 when the beta label came off. Uh, and that was awesome. Right? I told you, we're the world's experts in cat photos and animated GIFs. So this is Google in 2013, today, right? So 2000, 2013. So I was looking at this, I was like, <laughs> what is going on? It is the same, right? So just for comparison, this is the White House in the year 2000. Those are animated American flag GIFs. <laughs> this is yesterday, right? So. Here's Wired in the year 2000. Um, this was yesterday, right? And here's the Wall Street Journal in the year 2000. You could sign up for an AT&T WorldNet deal, whatever that was. 
Uh, and here it is yesterday, though that one actually isn't that different. Um, but you get the point, right? Um, why is this still the same? And this, by the way, uh, is a slight digression, is a highly technical term. I know we have a lot of engineers in the audience. Um, the only valid metric of code quality and product quality is the rate of WTFs per hour, and it should be a continuous function, not a bucketed function. So I will use this throughout the presentation. So something's happened. The web today is not the web we had in 2000, and yet we're still using the same metaphors of search and navigation. So why? Well, I think now is the time that that's going to change, and I think the people in the room are the people who are going to change it, which is why I'm really excited to be here. So what's changed? We can access CPU power at a price that is ridiculous. I have students who are using their tips from working in a bar to spin up clusters of hundreds of machines and analyze their own DNA. Um, like, we live in the William Gibson future in some ways. Um, this cat can probably run Hadoop. That's amazing, right? And so once we get our, our data and our infrastructure, we actually know what to do with it. Uh, we can run classification systems, like this is spam, at the scale of the internet. We can run recommendation systems. We can recognize entities pretty well. Though again, I wanted to share a personal story. In 2008, a search engine called Cool launched. Apologies if anyone here in the room worked on it. Cool was gonna destroy Google um, by having a better layer of semantic recognition and better image parsing. Except they kept doing things like this, so that was my bio at the time. And that is Hillary Mason, the character actress, and her role is ugly hag. Um, so this is really not cool. <laughs> This was 2008, so I thought, okay, you know, uh, we've come a long way, but then this January, uh, this is Bing celebrities. I am not a celebrity, by the way, but she is. Um, so there's me, and uh, there she is, her bio. Um, she <laughs> passed away in 2006. So there's actually a rule in Bing that says, if Hillary Mason, don't do this. Uh, so that's how I've won the internet. And then, uh, so this is last week. <laughs> Um, Google decided that uh, this photo of me, which is one I actually like quite a lot, um, is the photo of the actress Hillary Mason and started displaying it in her movie search results. Um, so, okay, this is hard stuff. <laughs> so we have CPU powers, we have algorithms, we can combine these two, uh, but the most revolutionary thing is that we have data. Um, and that data allows us to basically take a person and not represent them as a number, but understand them in a much richer way than we've ever been able to understand people on the web before. We have content, we have people. I mean, the top's cut off, but um, that's one of the best Google graph searches, mothers of Jews who like bacon. Uh, we have social connections and a social graph that we can overlay on our content and on our people. Um, so how do we make these useful? And I'm going to talk about some of our work at Bitly. Um, we're trying. I don't think we've succeeded yet. Um, so you can tell me where we're going wrong or missing out on opportunities. But Bitly is a weird thing. It, it, we take big things and make them small. We take URLs and shorten them. And that's what most people know about Bitly. Um, but there's a whole lot more that goes on behind the scenes here. So when someone clicks through that short link, you get a HTTP standard 301 redirect, uh, and off you go to the destination. And these links pop up in all sorts of weird places. Um, Dalai Lama is a big Bitly fan. Uh, Minecraft. This is one of my favorite uses ever, where somebody actually used a Bitly link in an installation process. So you curl the Bitly link, and it installs some software for you on a GitHub page. Um, so at Bitly, we see the links, the content that people are sharing, and the clicks. Um, and from those click distributions, we can learn a lot of really interesting things. So this is a very popular link. If you can read the title, you'll understand why. Um, but it also demonstrates one of the things we learn, which is that there is a canonical representation of a human sharing a piece of content with other humans, and it looks like this spike and decay. And this theme is repeated uh, throughout our data. 
And so these links also get shared all over the place so we can watch content jump from one social network to another, from one device to another, from one person to another, um, both explicitly through seeing public tweets and Facebook updates and implicitly by seeing that, you know, you clicked on a link shared by that person again and uh, then have gone on to click on related links or things like that. And it's global. About 30% of the traffic is US, the rest is around the world, and this is just a sphere on which we've plotted the latitude and longitude of one hour of clicks. Um, it's from an open source Google WebGL experiment, if anyone wants to make a similar visualization. It's pretty cool. So it was totally an accident. Um, nobody woke up one day and said, you know what, I am inspired, I'm going to create the world's greatest URL shortener and it's gonna you know, change social search forever. Um, Bitly was actually a feature of another product that failed miserably. That product was around uh, adding a social layer to news consumption. So the really quick version is the idea was you would be reading a news article on the web and you can't see who else is reading that article with you. So they built a system where you could see the mouse cursor of everyone else on the page simultaneously. And you could chat with them and share links. But instead of engendering this new age of philosophical debate over shared news consumption, people just started swearing at each other. Um, <laughs> and so as a product, that was a complete failure. But, um, but two pieces of technology came out of it. One of, it was, one of them was Bitly, the little link sharing utility uh, that gave you real-time analytics on what you were sharing. And the second uh, is because while you don't care to see who else is on a site with you, the publisher of that site really does care to see it, um, and that's Chartbeat, which is our sister company, just down the street from us in New York. Um, and this baby picture, by the way, was the most clicked baby in 2011. This is why we have a Hadoop cluster. So Bitly was a surprise, um, and there was, there was always this idea that there would be some value in the data and we would be able to build products off of the data that would somehow someday lead us to building a business. Um, and that's what we've been working on for the last three years. And it is big data, um, but it is not data so big that we have to invent new infrastructure to support it. So we see on the order of 25 million unique new pieces of content per day. We crawl that, so there's quite a bit of content there. Uh, about 150 humans, 150 million humans clicking on links. That's once we filter out the bots and all the other stuff. Uh, in the total set, tens of billions of URLs, but our core URL store is still in MySQL and I'm not allowed to run a count on it. So I don't actually know what that number is. What we've essentially done is assembled a massive database of human gossip. And it's not the whole internet, it's not the internet that Google sees, but it is the slice of the internet that people are actively paying attention to, sharing and engaging with at any given moment. And so from this, we had the idea that we could build a really interesting search product. Um, and we're still trying to do that. I'm gonna talk about a few basic lessons we've learned from the data and then I'll tell you how we're doing that and what happened and get back to the philosophy there. One of the first things you can observe from our data is that uh, your social network is not my social network. Um, this is the principle of homophily. That is, we tend to group with like. Um, when I talk to parents about social media, they usually tell me about what their kids do and how it's totally different than what they do. And that's because pretty much everyone else they associate with is very much like them. Their kids are the most different that they see. But there are people who are even more different yet. Uh, if you take the median person in a social network, they are nothing like you. Um, and here's one example of a young woman on Twitter who is saying quite honestly that any white person on Twitter is a spam account. This is not true for anyone in this room. It's true for her. Um, and here's a guy who, again, this is a little bit cut off, but he's on Facebook holding a funeral for his pet fish. And the best part is the bit at the bottom, may Cod rest his soul. Um, this is not what I see on Facebook and probably not what you see, but it's brilliant and I wish it was. Um, and if you want to play with this, I made a website to demonstrate this purpose. It has nothing to do with Bitly, but it's tweet.onerandom.com and it just pulls one random tweet off of Twitter. It might not be safe for work, so do it here at the conference. Um, you can play with it. Whoops. Um, 
So geography affects the way people consume information as well. I'm a New Yorker. We are really religious about our pizza. I don't know if we have any other New Yorkers in the room, but you know what I'm talking about. And when New Yorkers read articles about pizza, they, they read words like this, cheap and cheese and raise original. And those are the important things. It's what we care about. Um, when people who live in San Francisco read articles about pizza, they read things like this. Um, this is not pizza. <laughs> Um, and when people in Rome, Italy, are reading about pizza, um, they're reading these words, um, which, you know, I think they started the whole trend so we can give them a little bit of credit. But your, your geographic context changes what you want to consume about a topic and it, it changes your behavior. And so here's, on the same principle, a little bit more serious study we did with Forbes where we ranked the influence of US media properties by state and found things that surprised no one, like Fox News is disproportionately influential in Texas. Um, and by influential, we just uh, took the mean traffic by state and looked at the difference from the mean for each property. Um, and then we find a few things that are not at all surprising, like NPR in Oregon and The Onion in Wisconsin. <laughs> but we can use this stuff. So the networks you use impact the way you behave as well. Um, and by networks, I mean social networks. It's a different kind of geography. Uh, we find the half-life of a link on Twitter is 2.8 hours. That means it'll get half the clicks it'll ever get in that point. Um, 3.1 on Facebook, um, longer on YouTube, longer on Tumblr, on Pinterest, uh, but not much. Uh, content on social networks tends to live a fairly short amount of time. Uh, and people do occasionally come back and revisit old content, um, but it's not really predictable. But if you want to maximize clicks on Twitter, and of course this is what everyone always asks us, so we have the graph that's uh, Monday at the top, Sunday at the bottom, um, and the hours going horizontally, uh, you should share during business hours, because that is when people are awake and clicking on links. This, of course, is the aggregate. In particular, you should share whenever your people are awake and share things they actually like. But in aggregate, um, Facebook is similar but more diffuse. So Facebook gets more use early in the morning and late at night. And Tumblr parties all night long <laughs> has something to do with their demographics. We actually found out that uh, Tumblr is ridiculously popular in South Korea. Um, way more than Facebook or anything like that. And the way people consume data changes their behavior also. So this is again Monday on the left and Sunday on the right of the graph, and this is device usage for clicking on links through Bitly. It's pretty simple. And there are, uh, I actually lost a bet because of this graph. I had bet that iPads would be used most in the morning, but they're most used in the evening, and the kinds of content people look at are much more passive content uh, YouTube videos, that kind of stuff. Um, but Thursday night, there's a huge spike in people on social networks on their gaming devices. It's just really weird, I think it's college students. Um, and if you look at device similarity in time, we find iPhone and Android are almost the same, but Blackberry is not a smartphone. Um, people use it really differently. The Kindle is a completely unique device. People do use it on social media, but they're not using it the same way. One of the final examples, this is science, don't laugh. Um, one of the final examples I'll share uh, before getting back into the, the engineering side of things is that uh, we're learning a lot about human behavior from the exhaust of their social online behavior. And we're, we're able to confirm and repeat uh, a lot of the work that's come out of the last 50 years of social science research with a Hadoop query, which is an amazingly interesting thing. And one of the most uh, surprising findings, at least for me, is that uh, what you share is not what you read. Um, and this, I owe my colleague Matt LeMay all of the credit for this image and this metaphor, because we, we spent a long time thinking about how to represent it. Um, the content that you publicly share under your social identity uh, is more like this. So it's news articles, it's uh, beautiful Instagram photos or photos of family, 
Um, it's things that you are passionate about and want to promote and put your identity behind. The people who share those sorts of things were at the same time clicking on these things. Um, that's the Kardashians. Uh, sports, uh, dirty jokes on collegehumor.com, and things that you know nobody will ever admit to clicking on, but we can prove you actually would click on something like this. Um, and so, so we see this phenomena where people's public uh, statements of content and identity are really disparate from their private behavior. Uh, and they don't, the tools we have tend to address that public behavior. They don't really serve the private behavior. Uh, and so we think a lot about how we build services that give people what they really want to consume uh, without scaring the crap out of them. We've learned a lot about behavior. <laughs> Cute monkeys. So our search challenge, given the data I've described and the lessons we've learned, is how do we figure out what the world is paying attention to right now? Um, and how do we build a product that makes that data compelling and useful to people? And we've done a pretty good job with the engineering side. And we're doing an okay job with the, the product side. If you wanna skip to the end, uh, go to rt.ly in your browser on your phone and you can just play with it. Uh, you do have to log in with a Bitly account, but nothing nefarious will happen to you, and it's totally free and open. Um, but I'm going to talk about it in three components, because we built three pieces of infrastructure to support this search. The first is what we call our search infrastructure, and that is built on solar. The second is something that we built uh, from scratch called Bursts. And the third is Stories. The quick way to think about these is search is when you have a query and you want to navigate through the data to get an answer to that query. You guys all know this. Burst is the opposite side of the search problem. It tells me what is happening in the world right now. Uh, and stories is the human side of the search problem, which takes the results of the previous two systems and shares them with me in a way that I, as a human being, want to navigate it, uh, which is not as a ranked list of links. So search, I know what I want, I want to do a query. We built a real-time search system on Zoe, which is a solar plugin from Lucene. It is a very clever hack uh, that lets you mostly real-time index documents. Um, by hack, that's a compliment where I come from. Um, in case someone here is working on it, please continue to do so. Um, we took a exciting shortcut because we are building a real-time search service. We are not indexing every document for all time. We drop them out of the index if they receive no activity within 24 hours. This saves us a lot of money and a lot of memory. Um, there's a star by clicked because there's actually a whole nother piece of infrastructure that evaluates each click as to how representative it is of human social behavior. And we only pay attention to the human clicks. Um, but that's another talk. The really quick diagram looks something like this. A click comes in, it goes into a queuing system, it goes to solar processing. We have a separate uh, system that does the actual uh, content crawling analysis and storage. We take the raw HTML content, we pull the meaningful content out of it in a content extraction process, and we save all of that. Um, and then we have a separate system that works with our solar system, which is a cluster of Redis machines, um, where every click coming through that queue can change the potential ranking elements for a document. And so that way, when someone does a query, we use solar to pull the entire set of documents that might match that query out, and we use that real-time scoring system to re-rank them. So the rankings can change on a second-by-second -second basis, uh, depending on what people are clicking on. Um, and the calculations we've done on top of that. Bitly loves open source. Um, we contribute to open source. Uh, we also have open sourced our queuing system, which is called NSQ. It is one of the top 10 watch projects on GitHub, and it's a really powerful Go-based queuing system. So if anyone wants to check that out, you should. But uh, this is what a query looks like. So here's a query for Lucene. It pulls every document out of the index that has a keyword match for Lucene, and then it re-ranks based on current popularity, uh, where popularity is a function of metrics like how many clicks it's gotten, where, which social networks are sending those clicks, and how many from different social networks. So 
a document that's getting traffic from just Twitter will rank below one that is getting traffic from Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, and Pinterest. Uh, who has clicked on that document? We don't call them influencers, because I think that's a little bit of a bullshit term, but we try to find people whose behavior is predictive of future popularity. And we do. Um, and that may be someone famous like Tim O'Reilly who's tweeting technical documents, or it might be one of you who happens to follow a blog that uh, you, you're always one of the first people to click on that blog, and then it goes on to become popular. Uh, and we can return results, but this is a fairly standard query. Uh, things get more interesting when you do a query like this. So this is a query for food, documents about food being clicked statistically disproportionately in the state of California. And the way you should think about this is not as a static search, but rather that the document stream is moving and we're describing a segment of that stream we'd like to look at. So we will pull out every document from the solar index that we've tagged as relevant to food. We have a classification infrastructure doing that. And then we do, we look at the locations from which people are reading that particular link. And we calculate the entropy of that distribution so we can find that a link is being read disproportionately and significantly from California. My favorite one is actually food being read in Brooklyn because it's full of artisanal pickles and whatnot. And I have a Twitter bot that just tweets all that stuff as well. But this is the kind of search that I think is really interesting. So the second piece of infrastructure here is a bit of a different system. Uh, we built the search component first, and it was great. We made our own uh, UI that looked just like Google, and we would sit there like, being like, what's going on in the world with cheeseburgers? Um, but eventually we realized that that's only half of the question in the social search space. Uh, I have the entire set of what people are paying attention to in memory, and I have no way to know what's going on. And so we built a system that allows us to do that. And we do it by, from each page we crawl, we extract the significant key phrases, and we have a system that monitors the click rate on those key phrases in real time in memory. And we look for phrases that are receiving more than two standard deviations, clicks per second, above expected based on a model. It's a pretty simple calculation. I'll actually show it to you. Um, for people who do a lot of algorithmic data engineering, you're probably very familiar with this process. We like to solve things correctly at first at the whiteboard, and then we write the code and realize it will never work in production. So we figure out how to take things and simplify them. Um, so we took, in this case, an integral and simplified it down to a sum over a function distribution that we chose based on that knowledge we have about what social click distributions look like. Um, this is great because it's also completely interpretable. We took this model and first we built it in Python and it didn't work, so then we built it into a database in C um, and we get this clicks per second calculation for free and it's on the key phrase. So we've got 600 million key phrases in memory uh, we're storing the rate of clicks per second every 15 minutes for all time across the language. And we do this run through that database um, every 15 minutes to find out what is bursting. So here's an example of the kind of graph we can draw off of this. Each color in the graph here is a different piece of content that contains the phrase Bitcoin. I actually proposed we start a currency at Bitly, Bitly coin, where the value of the currency was correlated to the rate of clicks on people talking about the currency, but that was not an idea that got a lot of support. Um, this is one from this morning, uh, the phrase blue cockerel, which uh, I had never seen before on the internet necessarily, was bursting. It got that spike of attention. There are two different articles contributing to it. I went and looked at why, and uh, this article was why. It is a slow news day today. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have a better example. Um, but this graph allows us to very easily detect when something is happening um, and then to plug that into our search service to find out uh, what the content is. We've also built a system where we use the phrases that are bursting to build a priority queue on what gets indexed in our search, which is a hack on a hack on a hack, but works quite well to make sure we have the best data in there. If you go to rt.ly and do an empty search, you will see the bursting stories. 
Um, so that's what's on the homepage. It's not filtered by language, so if you look at it uh, late at night in the United States, you'll generally see things from around the world pop up. Um, and it's not just America. And it's a lot of sports. The last piece of this is one we've been working on a little bit more recently. And again, came from having built that. Uh, we realized that people don't think about consuming content um, on an atomic level of a link. Like if I've read one link about a story, I don't need to see 10 more of them. Um, so we built a system that dynamically agglomerates collections of links into stories. And it allows you, it's very simple. It works on keyword overlap and attention overlap. So if someone is paying, or people are paying attention to content that is similar at the same time, we group it into a story. And that just lets us say that, you know, here is a cluster of content about this thing um, in one beautiful little interface. So we can read things the way humans read things, and we can start to model the half-life of stories, not the half-life of links and guests at stories. I'm pretty excited about this one. I think the next step is summarization. So again, if you want to check it out, we'd love your feedback. Uh, and there are APIs that are public uh, for all of these systems. So if anyone wants to play with them, please do. I don't have a clock, so I have no idea how I'm doing. Well, this is, uh, this is my last philosophical statement. Um, I really do think that we are entering into a time when search will change. Um, and we have the capacities now to build these things. We just haven't really figured out how to do that. Um, and it's not just a technical problem. It is a data access problem. Uh, those of us who have data are a rare privileged class. Um, Bitly is a weird company because we're a tiny company with a unique data set. Um, all of you in the room, if you're coming from all these companies whose logos I saw, have really interesting, unique data. Um, but we don't have ways to work together to combine our data to make a better experience for people. We have lots of things to work on. Site search uh, almost always is terrible. Not on your sites, of course, but on everybody else's. Um, people search, even graph search on Facebook is highly constrained. There's no API for it, uh, and it's limited. I have no useful geo search. Search on a mobile device is an entirely flawed experience. Um, food search, and maybe I'm just hungry. Um, and the infrastructure to support var various kinds of search needs to grow up too. And a lot of the best infrastructure for search is in this community. Um, but it hasn't really changed that much in the, in the last few years. Because we all want to get here, right? This is Star Trek. This is the interface to a computer where you have to say three words, like computer, play Gilbert and Sullivan, and it does that. Um, and that's ultimately what we want, all of our knowledge, all of our people at our fingertips, before we even know that we want to make that query. So I'm a data scientist. Um, I'm in New York, and I work at Bitly. And uh, thank you. I guess we'll have time for questions. So when, when a person gets a link and it goes onto a social network, what's the general flow? Does it burst out to all the others, or is there uh, a direction as it hops from one place to another? So generally, uh, we will see an initial spike of attention, and most links don't go anywhere and don't get a lot of traffic, which is demoralizing, but that's the truth. Um, some things we'll see uh, over the course of about 20 hours, it'll run through. So we'll see one smaller spike, another spike, another spike. Um, and then there are behaviors where a link has received traffic, and then some event happens that makes it much more popular. And that could be somebody uh, like Tim O'Reilly tweeting it or Kim Kardashian tweeting it. Um, and then it'll change that behavior entirely. My question was really, you started out saying that people's social networks are very different from each other, and then you talked about a system that shows you things that are trending on social networks, but I didn't hear you talk about um, how personalized you're able to make that experience for people. I don't know if you're doing that or not. Yeah, that's actually, um, 
That's a very good question. In the public UI that we have available, there's no personalization, but, um, but it, we've been really interested in this and we have a system we're using internally where um, we build the, the network of share and click events and use that to find content. Um, so if you imagine the network, each node in the network is a link or a story and each connection is you and somebody you know uh, both saved that link or clicked on that link, uh, we are able to find highly personalized, highly relevant content for you. Um, we figured out the algorithmic piece of that. It's actually, um, my colleague Brian Off has been leading that research project and it's based on an algorithm called Spear that was originally developed as a spam resistant way to find expertise in delicious networks. Um, but we haven't figured out the product piece yet. Um, ultimately, I'd like to join those things where we will have a notion of what is going on globally and a personalized notion of what you are interested in and be able to use that layer to find you the things that you're interested in globally without annoying you. Additional from IDC. Uh, two questions. Uh, one is, are you making use of linked data? And, and what are you planning on doing with that? And then the other question is, how are you actually, how is Billy actually monetizing all of this work? I was hoping in a room full of engineers, no one would ask the second one. Um, so by the first question, I assume you mean uh, like sparkle and the semantic notations. We've actually not done very much with that, um, mainly because we tend to fall back to techniques that are much faster and can work at a scale where we can you know, run them over millions of pieces of content a day without more than a few boxes dedicated. Uh, I have used microformats really successfully though um, which is sort of a spiritual cousin um, to classify the kinds of content uh, that we're looking at for things like recipes, resumes, um, and use that as a training set that we can then apply more broadly. As to the how we make money uh, question, we have a enterprise dashboard product that is primarily targeted at brands, publishers, and celebrities, where they pay us money to see aggregate data about the success of their content and brand online. Um, we also charge people for uh, commercial access to these APIs. Um, and we have a bunch of new products coming out that give people more interesting insight into what their audience does on social networks when they're not on their content. So we don't sell individual data. Um, I believe that when you click on a link on the internet, you have an expectation of privacy and we would never expose that. But we do learn things in aggregate from that data that we can then sell. So an example there is that a brand might, um, might share a link um, and they can, be, they can find out that their audience in Texas is really into motorcycles, but the people who looked at this other link are mostly in Canada and they're really into snowshoeing, not to stereotype, um, but that kind of information. Uh, hello, uh, Aaron Bins from Internet Archive. How many national security letters or other uh, warrantless requests from law enforcement has Bitly received? And what has been your response? We've received zero. Uh, they don't really know that we exist. <laughs> yes. Um, the only legal issue we've ever had to deal with in that sense is that we've, re we've had a couple of links to child pornography that we have immediately disabled. Other than that, um, we block spam and malware but by block, we issue a 302 redirect to a page that says this is most likely spam and malware. We don't delete links, we don't alter them. And hopefully we won't have to deal with that. Yes, so um, the question is, how do we deal with slang in different languages? Um, so we, 
Every system we have works on every human spoken language except our topic labeling system, which only works in English. Uh, but I'm not sure how good any of them are in any language other than English, because I am an American, um, <laughs> to be honest about it. Um, and we, we have a notion of, uh, so we, t we have our high-level topics, and we have our low-level key keywords extracted from the content. We do, across our entire set of content, some keyword clustering and then labeling of those clusters. And the hope with that is that we would be able to capture um, the various slang ways to describe one thing uh, in a cluster and at least be able to say it's, it's that thing. Um, I have no idea how good it is outside of English. It is okay in English. Um, this is a big challenge uh, and it's really hard to work on NLP algorithms in languages you do not speak. Um, so if you have any advice, I'd love to hear it. All right. I think it's good for a coffee break. Thank you. I guess we'll have time for questions.